Hello, my name is Jack, and I'm going to tell you about the justification for a policy of containment, which thwarted the expansion of the Soviet Union and communism during the Cold War. I'm going to talk about the political landscape during the time in which the policy of containment was formulated and enacted, and I will also give multiple different perspectives from the parties involved in the policy's creation. This will be to clearly show that even though the policy of containment towards the USSR and the Cold War stifled diplomatic action between the US and USSR, it was justified by the political situation between the two differing nations. Before I go into detail on what the containment policy was, some background must be given first. The year is 1945, and World War II has just ended, bringing an end to the Axis powers' attacks on the world's freedoms. The victors were the Allies, who were led mainly by the three powers at the time, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union. These powers had to manage the post-war recovery of Europe. Many countries that had been ravaged by the Axis powers needed assistance in recovery. The US, UK, and France took charge in assisting the Western countries of Europe. The Soviets took control of the Eastern countries. The Soviets were able to establish communist puppet governments through the use of their army, which occupied the region of Eastern Europe, known as the Eastern Bloc. This bloc contained the countries of Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Albania. The Soviets insisted that the establishment of these communist puppet governments was legitimately in the interest of the Soviet defense against the West. Western Europe's recovery was under the control of the US, UK, and France. The US, UK, France, and the Soviets were allies in World War II. This idea that the West posed a threat to the Soviet Union strained the once allies relationship. It was also agreed that Eastern Europe would hold free and fair elections. Stalin went back on his word and took political control of the Eastern Bloc. These decisive moves shifted the West's perception of the Soviet Union from a once unlikely ally to now a political, economic, and possibly even a military adversary, which was rapidly expanding its borders and political control. In response to this Soviet expansion, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, declared an iron curtain descended across Europe. This showed a clear separation of the once allies' allegiance, although in that same speech Churchill stated, I repulse the idea that a new war is inevitable. This was in response to a speech Stalin gave in Russia that promoted the idea of an inevitability of war between the East and the West. This Iron Curtain left Europe divided in two, the capitalist-controlled West and the communist-controlled East. These two ideologies, capitalism and communism, differed greatly at their core. Both the capitalists and the communists viewed their economic systems as just and fair, while at the same time viewing their opposition's economic systems as a corrupt and an affront to people's freedoms. This ideological conflict was the driving force between the rising tensions between the once allies. Both sides wanted to pursue the expansion of their political and economic doctrine. The expansion of one doctrine directly relinquished the other side's global influence. Capitalist and communist leaders took notice that the strengthening or expansion of one side led to the other's weakening or shrinking. This sort of capitalism versus communism outlook only created tension, and as tensions began to rise between the East and the West, American diplomats and state officials searched for a plan. There were three main routes that could be taken on how to handle the rising tensions with the Soviets. One option was to do nothing. This option was not favored by many Americans at the time. Many Americans felt that the Soviets were subjecting unwilling people to communism and taking away their freedoms. Debate then ensued on whether to use military force to aggressively pursue the demise of the Soviet Union, or to use a diplomatic strategy of containment to halt the spread of communism. This strategy of containment was outlined in George F. Kennan's long telegram. This telegram was written by George F. Kennan, who at the time was the deputy head of diplomatic relations for the U.S. State Department in Moscow. The State Department called him to explain the political situation in Moscow. In response, Kennan sent an over 5,000 word long telegram, which is now known as the Long Telegram. This telegram discussed the Soviet leaders' perspectives and how the U.S. policy should react to the Soviets' actions and predicted actions. According to Kennan, the Soviet leaders at the time believed that capitalism and communism were destined to compete as leading ideologies and that only one would prevail. They also believed that the nature of capitalism was one of war and internal conflict. This belief in capitalism's tendency for conflict was viewed as proof for the inevitability of a capitalist versus communist conflict of some form. Although the Soviets maintained the belief that they would emerge victorious from such a conflict, they knew it would only halt the spread of communism. The spread of communism and the expansion of Soviet control was the main goal of the Soviet Union, and as such was pursued at all costs. This expansion of Soviet influence in communism would diminish the influence of all socialist and capitalist states. The diminishing of capitalist states' influence was a direct threat to the U.S. The U.S. needed to respond to the Soviet's expansion, but how? Kennan believed he had the answer. 
In his telegram, Kennan describes the actions America should take to contain the expansionist tendencies of the Soviet Union, while at the same time maintaining peace throughout the world. Kennan believed that a policy of containment rather than direct military intervention was the right decision. A containment policy was a policy preventing any Soviet expansion through economic or political processes. This meant that any way the U.S. could prevent the expansion of communism through the use of indirect force it would pursue. Kennan felt that the Soviet Union would crumble under its own weight if its expansion could be forestalled long enough. Some Americans did not support the containment policy, for they saw the expansion of the Soviet Union as justified. They saw that in the history of Russia, its leaders often held deep-rooted paranoia of outsiders. Fear of external invasion was always met with strong defensive and offensive policies. The offensive policies and the acquisition of adjacent land created a buffer zone that protected the Russian leadership. The opposition of the containment policy cited this knowledge as reason for Soviet expansion. Another argument was that containing the expansion of the Soviet Union and the communist doctrine that came with it would only aggravate the Soviets and lead to military conflict. Military conflict between the East and the West had to be avoided at all costs. The war had just seen the devastation that World War II had caused, and the first use of the atomic bomb was on everyone's mind. One American senator, John Foster Doles, argued against the containment policy, but for the exact opposite reason. Foster felt that the U.S. should use military force to roll back the expansion of communism. This would take the form of wars of liberation and the direct use of a military force in Soviet and communist-controlled regions. Another flaw in the policy of containing the Soviets was that it would stifle diplomatic action between the U.S. and USSR. This is because if the U.S. tried to stop what the Soviets were trying to do, it would only aggravate the Soviets. So with these three distinct solutions to the Soviets' expansion laid out on the table, the U.S. leaders still had to decide one to rally around. Harry S. Truman, the president from 1945 to 1953, pushed for the adoption of a policy of containment. The reasons for this are as follows. Any direct military conflict with the Soviets would result in all-out war that was not favorable to either side and thus should be avoided at all costs. This ruled out a rollback solution, especially considering the Red Army's presence in the Eastern Bloc at the time. Doing nothing allowed the Soviets to strengthen their footing on the global stage and use that leverage to weaken the U.S.'s influence around the globe. This was outlined in Kennan's long telegram, in which he told U.S. leaders that the Soviets would seize every opportunity they could to weaken the U.S.'s influence around the world. Many Americans also felt strongly compelled ethically to stop the Soviet expansion, for Soviet expansion subjected unwilling people to communism and often unnecessary suffering. This suffering can be seen in the Ukrainian famine, which claimed the lives of millions and was a direct result of communist control. This ethical concern outweighed the notion that the Soviet expansion was justified. Lastly, the diplomatic relations were already rocky with the Soviets. According to Kennan, the Soviet government was one of paranoia that inhibited the flow of information. Kennan feared the information exchange between the U.S. and USSR diplomats was tainted, altered, or completely misconstrued before it ever reached top Soviet leadership. For this reason, diplomatic relations with the Soviets could be set aside, for they were not promising to lead to any effective compromises between the two differing nations. These notions led Truman to following the guidance of Kennan and his telegram, and beginning a policy of containment. The first mention of this sort of policy from Truman can be seen in his A Fateful Hour speech. President Truman stated, I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability and orderly political processes. These words were followed with actions. The U.S. allocated $400 million to economically support Greece and Turkey in their fight against communist revolutionaries. At the end of the day, the policy of containment was one of the most influential policies of the Cold War. It allowed the U.S. to subvert the Soviet's influence over the world and forestall the expansion of communism into its regions of interest. Its justification can be seen through the lens of the past. At the time, it was the only option the U.S. had to combat the growing Soviet threat without entering into a direct conflict with the Soviets. Although the economic and political conflict inhibited diplomatic relations between the two nations, it was justified for the expansion the Soviets had to be contained, for political, economic, and ethical reasons. What is so fascinating about the policy of containment and its creation and enactment is how international diplomacy and debate was set aside to make way for internal debate and diplomacy. Many contrasting ideas and philosophies on how to handle the tensions with the Soviets were brought to the table. And what is so amazing is this sort of internal diplomacy worked in solving international problems. The policy of containment shows the value of debate and diplomacy in our everyday lives. It shows how people with contrasting ideas can still work together towards the goal of finding a solution even in the most high stakes of circumstances.